Welcome back to Simply Money. Today, we're going to be talking about the top five steps in choosing a solid ETF. An ETF is an exchange-traded fund, and they're popular investment tools due to their low cost, diversification, and ease of trading. They can be a valuable addition to any investment portfolio, whether you're a novice investor or a seasoned pro. Understanding how to choose the right ETF can help you align your investments with your financial goals and risk tolerance. Now, I want to talk to you about these five steps. There's lots of different things you can look at. Now, I've done some videos on why you should not look at just buying single stocks. Check out the one I just did recently on NVIDIA and why using that as an investment alone can be very detrimental. You want to diversify. There's lots of information out there. I've done other videos on what diversification is and why it's important in your portfolio. As the old saying says, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. So you don't want all your money in one stock. Step number one in choosing a solid ETF is to define your investment goals. If you don't know what your goals are, you don't know what kind of ETF you want. You'll fall for the latest YouTube video on buy this ETF or buy this mutual fund. And so before diving into the world of ETFs, it's crucial to identify what you want to achieve with your investments. Are you looking for long-term growth, income generation, or risk management? Different ETFs cater to different investment strategies, and so it's important to know what your goal is, to understand what it is you are trying to achieve. Because you can watch a video or talk to a friend, and their goals can be completely different. So if you fall into buying what they're invested in, it may not meet your goals. So long-term growth is equity ETFs and sector-specific ETFs. Income generation would be bond ETFs, dividend-focused ETFs. And risk management would be things such as gold ETFs, treasury bond ETFs, and such as that. An actual tip for you is to write down your financial goals, your time horizon, how long is it going to be until you need the money? I had a friend recently asked me if they should invest the money they're using to pay down their house in the stock market. And my adamant answer was no, because you should be putting that on the principal immediately. Or should I keep the money I want for a down payment on my house in the stock market? And again, unless you're going to be waiting 10, 15 years, my answer would be no. Put it in a high yield savings, maybe buy some CDs but you don't want to tie up your money, nor do you want to get caught where when you need your money and the market may be down, that you have to take it out at an extreme loss. That can be dangerous. So what is your time horizon? And what is your risk tolerance? Some people can handle the ups and downs, the highs and the lows of the stock market and of higher growth stocks or ETFs, such as technology fields, and others cannot. So you need to know what your risk tolerance is because if you're not in your risk tolerance, you're going to be pulled in and out of the market because your emotions will get the best of you. Use this as a guide to narrow down your ETF choices. Step two is research the ETF's underlying index. An ETF's performance is directly tied to an index it tracks. The underlying index determines the ETF's holdings and sector exposure. You need to understand the index so you can gain insights into the ETF's risk and return profile. In order to do this, just visit the ETF provider's website for detailed information on the index. The ETF provider could be Schwab, could be Fidelity, Vanguard, whoever provides that ETF, go to their website, go to the ETF, and look at the information on the index. Look into the index's methodology. How do they choose what they're going to invest in, including how it selects and weighs its components? Some ETFs may be very similar in the types of stocks and the sector they're in, but the weighting of those could be vastly different. The top 10 stocks may make up 50% of that ETF. So you're not as diversified as you think. There may be 500 stocks in there, but if the top 10 make up 50%, you're really into 10 stocks with a little bit of diversification on the back end. So again, you need to understand the weighting of how much of each of the stocks and when does that get rebalanced. These are important things in analyzing along with the historical performance of the index. If it's a newer index, you may want to hold off. 
I know it can be exciting and think you're going to get the next big thing, but you may also get the next bust. I like to buy into ETFs that have shown a performance of at least 10 years. It has a performance to show me that their methodology is strong and healthy. For an example, if you consider an S&P 500 ETF like SPY, it is tracking the performance of 500 of the largest companies in the United States by market capitalization, by how much those companies are worth. That's step two, research the underlying index. Step three, evaluate the ETF's expense ratio. This is something a lot of people overlook. The expense ratio is the annual fee that all the funds or ETFs charge their shareholders. So when you buy, it covers the cost of managing and operating the fund. Lower expense ratios can significantly enhance your net returns over time. You might look at the performance on step two and think, wow, this index performs better than index over here. But the second index may have a much lower expense ratio. In actuality, you're making more money because the return that you keep is greater. The expense ratio is very important. For example, a 1% expense ratio means you pay $10 annually for every $1,000 invested. That's $100 for $10,000. That's $1,000 for $100,000. You get the idea, 1% of whatever is invested on an annual basis. So you want a lower expense ratio. Use the financial websites like Morningstar or ETF.com to compare the expense ratios of similar ETFs to see if you can get an ETF that performs the same, that tracks the same, that has the same methodology, the same weighting, but a lower expense ratio. That's more money in your investment portfolio. Look for ETFs with expense ratios below 0.50% for broad market exposure. Step number four, assess the ETF's liquidity and trading volume. All that means is liquidity refers to how easily you can buy or sell an ETF without affecting its price. High liquidity means tight bid-ask spreads and lower trading costs. Indicators of liquidity, trading volume such as Let's look at trading volume. Higher average daily trading volume generally indicates higher liquidity, meaning you can get your money out easier. The bid-ask spread, the difference between the highest price a buyer is willing to pay and the lowest price a seller is willing to accept. Tighter spreads indicate better liquidity. Check out the ETF's average daily trading volume on financial news platforms Avoid ETFs with very low trading volumes as they may have higher bid-ask spreads and be harder to trade. Because if you need to sell it, you want to be able to get rid of it and cash in your money, whether it's time for retirement or whatever it is you're using that money for. Make sure that you understand that liquidity is important. Again, you're not needing it tomorrow. But when you do need to go get it, you need to make sure it's available and that it's easier to get out and that you don't have a waiting period because liquidity is difficult. Number five, review the ETF's NAV in holdings. NAV is net asset value, is the per share value of the ETF's assets minus its liabilities. Kind of like figuring out your net worth. How much do you own? How much money do you have? How much do you have in your investments? All of that added up minus how much do you owe your liabilities? The NAV, the net asset value, is all of the assets of the ETF minus all the liabilities. The ETF's assets minus its liabilities provides insight into the ETF's current value. Reviewing the ETF's holdings ensures that the asset aligns with your investment strategy. Let's look at it. Analyzing the NAV is typically updated at the end of each trading day. And again, you can find this on the ETF provider website. Compare the NAV with the ETF's market price to check for significant premiums or discounts. If you take the assets minus the liabilities and divide that by the number of outstanding shares, that gives you the price value of that ETF. What is it selling for currently versus what is the NAV? If the 
selling price is way higher than the NAV, then that's a premium. You're paying way more than the value of the ETF, very much like a stock. If the value of the stock is much higher than the value of the company, you're paying a premium. But if the value, the cost of the index is lower than the current NAV, the value, then you're buying at a discount. That's when we want to buy. We want to buy at a discount. Now, again, I encourage you to do dollar cost averaging. If you find an ETF you like, buy into it on a regular, consistent cadence, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, <clears throat> consistently invest, and you'll get the highs, the lows, and you'll build a buy-in, and you'll make up for, you may buy high one day, you may buy low another day, and it averages out, thus dollar cost averaging. But the NAV, if you're into an ETF that has an extreme premium NAV, you may want to hold off. That thing is not a good buy right now. So you need to understand what the NAV is and look into it. Look at the top 10 holdings to see where the ETF's money is invested. Ensure the sectors and industries represent and align with your investment goals. For example, a technology-focused ETF. Check if major tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, or Google are among the top holdings. What is it you're buying into? The holdings are important to understand and the weighting of those holdings. Hope this is helpful. Remember, choosing the right ETF involves a thorough analysis of your investment goals, understanding the underlying index, evaluating expense ratios, assessing liquidity, and reviewing the NAV and holdings. By following these steps, you can make more informed investment decisions and build a portfolio that aligns with your financial objectives. Not mine, not your friends, not the newest YouTube video, but your goals that you set up on step one. Always remember to conduct your research and consult with a financial advisor if necessary. So for more financial tips and insights, subscribe to Simply Money and stay tuned for upcoming videos. Hit that like button and let me know what you thought about this video. Give me some feedback in the comments and I'll see you next time on Simply Money.